Heavenly Father, um, we're just uh, thankful uh, to meet here this morning, to have this beautiful sunshine day here. And I pray now, though, that you would turn our minds and attention towards the things of you, uh, to really focus in on what it means to do theology, what it means to be a theologian, what it means to think about you. Uh, give us wisdom, give us guidance as we do this, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, welcome to Introduction to Theology. This is the very first class in what is a core of six classes called the Theology Program. Uh, it does take 60 weeks to go through the entire program. You've only signed up for 9 to 10, so don't worry. You're, <laughs> we won't keep you here for that long, unless you want to be. Um, but just uh, some scripture to set our minds on things here is really just um, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Um, I think to give some commentary on modern Christianity in the United States, that we spend a lot of time talking about loving God with our heart, uh, with our soul, but we do a very poor job of loving God with our mind. Uh, we tend to say, hey, faith does not engage the intellectual mind. Um, uh, we tend to rely on emotion as opposed to intellect, uh, and there's a place for both. Uh, but Jesus says we are to love the Lord God with our heart, mind, and soul, the all of who we are. Uh, we do not raise heart above intellect or intellect above heart. Uh, we do it um, wholly as an individual. And so this one verse probably sums up the entire theology program. Is What we're trying to do is we're trying to call people back to a time where we think deep thoughts about God and understand who he is and who Jesus is and the Holy Spirit and what they've done for us. We will, well, that's small, isn't that? But you have it in your notes, um, the question outline. Uh, these are all the things that we will answer over the next uh, nine to ten weeks. Um, why are, uh, who are you and why are you here? What is a theology program? What even is theology? Who is a theologian? How do we do theology every day? These are some of the questions we'll talk about just this morning. And uh, we'll even talk about postmodernism, and, and, and uh, we'll even get into critical race theory a little bit at some point uh, in this 10-week session, talk about how all these things can play into how we read our Bible and, and the things that the broader American church is talking about in regards to these. Here's a course for the next 10 weeks uh, laid out. We will do two uh, sessions today, Introduction to Theology and then Defining Theology, uh, and then we will slow down and do one a week after that. So that being said, um, find session one in your notes. That's where we're going to pick up. Um, there is a syllabus at the front. I will talk about that a little bit later, but don't worry about that right now. Um, that's not for everybody. That's only for a select few individuals who want to take this class and get the most out of it. So um, today we're talking about defining the rules of engagement. Okay? Sometimes we don't realize is that we bring lots of presuppositions, which is things that we just take for granted when we go to read the scriptures. Um, and it'll shape how we think about things, think, shape how we think about God, and um, we need to be careful with that, because where did we pick up those presuppositions? We could have picked it up from anywhere, right? And so we want to talk about that a little bit this morning. So, who are you, and why are you here? So let's do this real quick. We're just going to go around the room super quick. I mean, I, I'm at two minutes. Just say your name and how long you've been at High Point. That's it. And then we'll just, we'll just go through. So my name's Chris. I'm a pastor here. I've been here since 2010. Crystal, does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's been here as long as I have. That's why I, I asked. I never thought about this. I think 2010 is when we met in, in uh, Pat Nemmer's basement. Yeah. So, Dave? Well, I don't have to introduce myself. You already did. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> Dave, I've been here at High Point for just a little over a year. Okay. Gary and I think almost three. Okay. All right. Good. Eight or nine years. Wow. Part of the original core group. My name's Lisa, and probably since I was in elementary. My name's Edward, and I've been here since 
one years old at that time. About a week then. David, <laughs> ditto. <laughs> All right, sounds good. So now uh, I had to introduce yourselves just because I want to make sure everyone kind of knew one another's names. Now, whether you'll remember that or not, but uh, after class, if you don't know, you can walk up and say, hey, did you say your name was? And uh, make that connection. So why are you here and why are you taking this course? I won't have you all answer that. But typically, this is the fourth time I have taught this course and probably the uh, if, if I include teaching it and taking the course myself, it would be my sixth time through the material. So uh, quite a bit. Uh, but th typically there are various people that take this course and we're just going to kind of uh, uh, talk about who those people might be and you'll probably find yourself relating to one of them. There is the practical Priscilla. This is a person who has never seen the practicality of deep theological study. Uh, you are here to see if we can change your mind, okay? and hopefully I will. So hopefully I'll make a good case for it. You've never seen the need for it. Someone told you, hey, you should come here, you should check this out, and, and you're just uh, uh, do it going through that. And hopefully uh, by the end of this, uh, you'll, you'll feel a lot more confident. There's scared Susan. Uh, big words scare you. Anyone scared by big words? Hypostatic union, huh? <laughs> propitiation, um, big words scare you. You don't really think that you are smart enough to be here. Everyone's really smart enough to be here. There's, there's no one who, uh, we, we don't go so deep that you won't be able to figure this out. You're here this time, but you may not be here next time is, is kind of your thought process. Um, there's know-it-all Nicks. Um, you already know everything. You're just here to see if I do. So, and, uh, and to pick up where I leave off. So, I don't know. I look around the room. I don't know if we have any know-it-all Nicks here or not. Maybe Daniel over there. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, Daniel and I had really good conversations. So, there's fundamental Fred. Uh, you are the God-ordained guardian of orthodoxy. You're here to sit with arms crossed and protect. And so, if I don't say something quite right, you'll jump on it. Well, if I do say something that is completely off base, please do speak up. Um, there's one and answer will. Uh, you have a lot of questions. You're here to not do theology in community, but you want to write theology down with pen and paper. Um, <clears throat> that's typically the Western mindset where most people are at. Uh, Christians in the United States have become consumers rather than contributors uh, to the church. And so we just, we just want to sit down and we want to consume sermons and books and read uh, like we're doing nothing more than just watching the 10 o'clock news or something like that. And so, um, <clears throat> and so if that's you, though, that's fine. But really, this class is going to push us not so much to learn good theology, but how to do good theology. That's the focus of this. Uh, I'll never tell you what to believe. There might be times where I say, hey, these are the different positions. This is what High Point Church believes. And I'll leave it at that, but I won't ever force you to come to a specific mindset. Uh, there's traditionalist Terry. You want to learn, but your traditions and preconceived notions bind you. You are here to have your traditions confirmed to be true. Um, in this class, you do have to kind of take your traditions that you've grown up with from whatever church or denomination you came from and kind of set them to the side temporarily. We're going to test those things. It doesn't mean they're not true. Uh, but we're at least going to examine them in great detail. Uh, you will find oftentimes in the course of the theology program, I will explain all the different views, and by the time I'm done, you may be confused on which one I hold, right? Um, I do not throw up straw man arguments just to make one view look better than the other. The goal is to examine them all fairly and come to a conclusion and know what you believe and why you believe it. We will go deep into Roman Catholicism. We'll go deep into Reformed theology, Arminianism, Calvinism. Uh, we'll even touch in on Mormonism at times. Although Mormonism is a cult, so that is not a main focus. It's not considered a church. If you have problems with that, take that up with the United States federal government, not myself. They're classified as a cult by the U.S. government. Confrontational Carl. 
you are not a believer in Christ or the Bible and have no intention of becoming one, you are here to argue. As I look around the room, I'm not sure I have any of those this morning. But I have in my classes before. Uh, Yvonne probably remembers a few of them. I get some people who just like, all they want to do is argue. And I'm just like, I am not trying to tell, convince you of something. I'm trying to lay out the views. Pick one. But uh, yeah. So then there's struggling Sam's. Uh, you're a believer in Christ, but you have a lot of doubts and you have a lot of struggles, right? A lot of Christians are here. They can relate to that. You have never had a safe place to express those doubts. You're here to see if this is a place. And yes, if you have doubts, ask questions. We want to talk about these things. Uh, please ask any question you ever want to ask in class or before class or after class. If it's in class and it's not the appropriate time to talk about it, I might just kind of say, hey, let's find a better time or something like that. But this is a safe place to ask questions and hopefully find reasonable answers. Then there's curious Carla's. You're not really sure why you're here. You're excited to find out. So I've had people like that too. Um, and so hopefully, though, it'll be a good time. No matter who you are, if you can relate to one of those or maybe you don't relate to one of those, um, basically in this class, we're all real people. We're all created by a real God. And we have real struggles, real questions, uh, real convictions, real things we want to learn. And I'm really glad you're here. And hopefully you're glad you're here as well. So what is the theology program? What exactly is it? Um, it gets talked about a lot sometimes on Sunday mornings, but I'm not sure anybody ever really says what it is. Um, there's a lot of assumptions out there. So I'm going to define exactly what it is right here for you. So if you're curious exactly what it is, this is what it is. This is the definition of what we're doing. The theology program is an intense theological studies program designed for busy people who will never go to seminary but who want deep theological training. While there are many great subjects, biblical and spiritual, that Christians can and need to study, our focus is on six specific courses of systematic theology. Our desire is to teach people how to think by opening their minds to diverse views, learning from history, we'll spend a lot of time talking about church history from time to time, Rest, we'll wrestle with difficult issues, and graciously engage in increasingly increasingly relativistic and postmodern world. Okay, if you don't know what relativistic and postmodern mean, basically it's just saying you, you can't, your truth is your truth. Okay, so what David's truth might be is his truth, and nobody can dare question it. And what's my truth is my truth, and nobody dare question it. In, in a postmodern world, there is no objective truth. Okay? And so we're going to talk about how do we engage that. The historical, conservative, Orthodox Christian view is truth is found in God's word and found with God and nowhere else. Chris, yes. Sorry, I have a question already. Go for it. Shoot. In here it says six specific courses. Our books say seven. Interesting. Like I said, I did the first six core courses, I do not, you know, that's that's someone else's material that I've been trained and certified to teach. There, the set I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later this morning. There are other classes, okay. yes. In fact, there's actually more than this, and there's, some of them are mine, and some of them are from other places, so we'll okay. talk about that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, our mission is renewing minds and changing lives by purposefully guiding people through a study of historic and biblical Christian theology. Um, did you know that there is a place and time in church history where all Christians thought that when Jesus died on the cross, he was paying a ransom to Satan? And that and buying our souls back. Now, you're probably looking at me like that sounds weird, but there's hundreds of years that Christians thought that. It's important to know what church history teaches and then what the Bible teaches and compare the two, right? And so there'll be all sorts of things that I'll share. You'll be like, how did Christians ever think that? Um, and then, you know what? 20 years from now, you'll go back, how did I ever think that? <laughs> Um, we, we're constantly comparing what we believe to what Scripture truly teaches. Our goal is not so much to teach good theology, as I said earlier, as important as that is, uh, but to teach people to think, right? That's, that's the goal. Um, I have been to Bible college. I've been to seminary, okay? I got degrees in both. And when you go to Bible college, they teach you good theology. They don't teach you how to think. Okay? They just say, this is, this, is, this is our denomination, this is our beliefs, this is our tradition, this is what you're going to think. 
when you get the seminary, they teach you how to think. They're like, here's the different views. And they'll say, hey, this is a doctrinal statement to sign to get that piece of paper at the end. But, but you know, these are the different views, and they really teach you how to think type thing. And that's our goal. We're tra- it's, so I sometimes say the theology program is like, it's like seminary for lay people. We take out the Greek. We take out the Hebrew. We, and we lower the, the qualifications so that everybody has access to the things that are being taught at a deep level. Because Sunday mornings in a 20 to 40 minute sermon is not the place to do super deep theology most of the time. You just don't have the time to develop things the way you would like. All right, so what makes the theology program different? Well, intensity in studies, if you so choose. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It's irenic theology. We're going to talk about that. Intentional program design, comprehensive coverage, doing theology and community. That's where we're going to address all six, all five of these right now. Okay, so here's, here's the idea. The church must have an avenue of intense, interactive Christian education through a program which gives people an opportunity to learn at a level that other venues cannot provide. Okay? This is not Sunday school. In Sunday school, most of the time, somebody is taking a prepackaged product that's usually not the deepest stuff in the world, but it's designed to develop community in Sunday school, and it's more devotional. Sometimes you get a little deep, sometimes, but most of the time Sunday school is not that way. Small groups, or uh, they're designed for fellowship first and foremost, and, and a place to, to for prayer and to have conversations about uh, some subjects. But you're never getting deep and intentional. The theology program is very intentional in its layout. So, for instance, you kind of look at here at this chart. Okay, a sermon is low commitment. You walk in in the morning, <clears throat> you can listen or not listen. All you got to do is sit there, or you can go stand in the back. You can sip your cup of coffee. You can d- bow your head, and you can snore. People do it. I've been up there. I see it. Okay? <clears throat> There's very low commitment. Um, you just show up. Fellowship, Sunday school, uh, community groups, whatever you want to call them, they have more commitment. Because usually then you, you can't hide on a sun- like you can on a Sunday morning. And you have to be involved in people's lives. In an interactive classroom, you can ask questions. I could even say, ask David a question. I could ask you a question, right, and call you out. I mean, there, there's a possibility of that. I, I, don't worry if you're shaking in your boots right now. I do not do that very often um, unless I have a specific reason in mind. Um, so there's high commitment. And some of that high commitment comes from the fact that if you so choose, you can actually take this to get a certificate of completion. Ray Burns, who's a member here at High Point, who actually is going to be helping me teach the Sunday evening class, um, he actually got college credit for taking the theology program, completing all the assignments and showing them to them, and that was at Grandview University. It, uh, it basically uh, gave him four credit hours for his religion class that he was supposed to take, so it helped him get it graduate. So colleges will sometimes honor it if you do all the work, get the certificate, you can show them what you did. You don't have to do that, though. You, you, you are welcome to treat this more like a Sunday school class and just show up and participate in class, and that's all you got to do. It's your choice. If you want the certificate, if you're interested, I will get you the syllabus, which uh, may or may not be in your notes. I think I actually pulled it out just so there wasn't confusion, and I, we will talk about how we can go through that, and I'll do all that. So if you have interest in that, email me, uh, text me, call me, talk to me after class. Whatever you want to do, and, and we'll make sure you get that. But it's, uh, it's well worth the time. I mean, there's basically a track attendance. There's assigned readings. There's books. There's papers. There's case studies. There's scripture memorization. They actually grade everything, too, and give you feedback on everything you do. So um, there you go. Uh, a sermon's more devotional. It brings encouragement for the week. Sometimes it'll bring even conviction. But what we're doing here is foundational. I mean, we're going to talk about things that once you wrestle with these things and you work these out, it'll go with you hopefully for the rest of your life. Um, we have several individuals in the church who would testify. If I asked them to come up here and say, hey, how did the theology program change your lives? They would absolutely say, it changed my lives. Um, and I could, I could do a whole, we could do a whole class on some of those people. Um, sermon is desert, designed for short-term life change in interactive classrooms, long-term life change. A sermon is more exhortation. A classroom is more about education. The edu- education program of the church needs to include all of these in balance. 
think about it. You have churches all over the country, right? And I have people time and time again come to High Point. They say, hey, there's churches don't do what you do. I'm like, well, yeah, because most of the time, most churches don't find value in it. They have anybody who expresses any kind of interest in anything deeper than a sermon or Sunday school, and they ship them off to Bible college and seminary. I'm like, oh, wow, so you're just gonna, you just threw $50,000 of debt around their neck. <laughs> um, you know, you really could go through this class and be prepared, potentially, with, if, you, if you actually took it for the certificate and you got continued on discipleship, you could actually probably go out and pastor a church after taking all this, if you, if you chose to make it that intense. Um, <clears throat> also, just back to that just for a moment. Okay? You may not realize this, but did you know there's an assault on good Bible colleges and seminaries across our country? We are just one Supreme Court decision away from most of the, of the good ones having to close their doors. All it's going to take is, oh, you know, you have, to, you have to allow LGBTQ people on your staff or, in, or in, to go to your school and certify them. Well, what's a good Bible college going to do with that? They're probably going to close their doors because they're, they're going to say, we're going to look at God's word and they're going to say, no, we're not going, we're not going to compromise just for the sake of that. And so who's really responsible for the education of the next generation of Christians? It's not Bible colleges, it's not seminaries. It's the church. It always has been and always will be. But for somehow we got this all out of balance for the last couple hundred years. And God may bring it around full circle where it falls on the church again. And I, I pray and I hope we're ready. Um, I'm ready. Are you ready? <laughs> Here's my challenge to you. All right. We talked about doing theology in ironic fashion. Ironic theology is done peaceably, accurately representing all views, even when you oppose them. The key is peace, okay? That's our goal in this class. I'm not looking to have arguments and fights, you know, between different views. I want to, I want to give a fair shake to all of them and work through them together. Then, but you can do it polemically. Polemic theology is theology that is done in a warlike manner, Inside the church, prophetically speaking against those whom there is disagreement, okay? There is a space for this. There are, so the New Testament is filled. 26 of the 27 New Testament books warn against false teachers and false prophets within the church. And, it, and Jesus is clear in his words. Paul is clear. John is clear. Peter is clear. That when somebody who, after you've tried lovingly to correct them in that way, they refuse, then, you, then it's war, not like physical war, but, but you, um, it's, there's, peace has gone out the door. They, they, there's church discipline avenues. There's people that you, you cast out of the church. I mean, you can read the New Testament and see these. And in one of the theology classes, we'll talk more about them. There's apologetic theology, which is the one you're probably most familiar with. People hear about apologetics all the time. Theology that is done to defend the faith against those who oppose. And it's, a, it's targeted at those outside the church, right? It comes from... First Peter, he says, be ready always to give a defense for the reason of the faith that's in you, type thing. And that's done peaceably oftentimes as well, um, apologetic theology. But we need all three in the church, and there's a place for all of them. This class, it's ironic. We're, we're, the goal is peace, to, to, to have a safe place to talk about things. So, the intentional program design. I don't know why that little square is up there, but it is. Introduction to theology is the first class. That's where you're at today, okay? And we will be this, this whole semester. And then in the, then this winter, spring time, right, summer right through there, we'll move on to bibliology and hermeneutics. There's those big words you're afraid of, Dave. <laughs> bibliology is the study of the Bible. Hermeneutics is the art and science of interpreting the Bible. And we'll walk through that. Then the next class is Trinitarianism. That is a deep study on the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Then we move to humanity and sin. What did God create? And then what went wrong when sin came into the world? What's the human condition? We talk about that. Then soteriology, fancy word for saying the study of salvation. When you receive Christ, when you get saved, what exactly happens? Um, and then... And often with that, it's the same time, there's what's called sanctification. How, how are you being perfected as you continue to live on this earth? And then also glorification. You know, when, when Christ comes back or, or when we, uh, or what happens after we die too. Then we finish up with ecclesiology and eschatology. That's a fancy way of saying 
the study of the church. What exactly is the church? How should it organize? What should it do? What should it focus on? Who should lead the church? How did, how did it come about? Um, and then eschatology is a study of in, in times, in things. Okay, That's everyone's favorite subject. Everyone joins us like, oh, I just, can we just do eschatology right away? I'm like, no, 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 let's build our way to it. Because as, who took Revelation? A good chunk of you. Okay, remember what I said in Revelation? You'll never understand Revelation unless you know the rest of the Bible. Okay, Revelation spends more time quoting the Old Testament than any other book. And so you have to know your Old Testament extremely well because you can almost piece the entire book of Revelation together from the Old Testament. Okay, So if you don't know the Old Testament, Revelation is going to be super confusing for you. And uh, same thing, if you don't understand what the church is and what Israel is and what, uh, how salvation happens and what the role of the Holy Spirit is and the human condition and who God is and your, your end times theology is going to be all over the place and just kind of... Just, you know, not grounded in scripture, is what I'm trying to say. In the courses, we will address all relevant major issues, current and historic, of which we think people need to be aware. That's the core classes, okay? Now, I've been, I've, I've told you six times through this, fourth time teaching it. What I've learned is that there is room, though, for other things. And they're important, okay? And so I have actually developed additional classes that, uh, that we'll offer from time to time. One is angelology, what the Bible really teaches about angels. This is an original work by me, um, which um, basically cuts through all the tradition, cuts through all the mythology of it, and just does an honest look at what Scripture teaches regarding all spiritual beings. Angels, cherubim, seraphim, demons, fallen angels, uh, Satan, um, and, and all those types of things. What the spiritual world might look like based on what scripture teaches, how God uses spiritual creatures to run the world and, and carry out his will, bring him glory. We talk about all those types of things. And, and I, did, I developed this because I got really concerned about how people talk about angels and Satan and demons. And I just most of the time people just talk pure and utter nonsense. It's not grounded in scripture. And so I said, we gotta, I got to try to fix this. So that's my attempt. Then there's Introduction to Biblical Counseling. If you want to know how to do Biblical and Aesthetic Counseling, I have a class on that. How to Teach the Bible, Deb. That's that seventh class that uh, they were working on but never really got quite finished. But I fleshed it out and I finished it for them. So how to teach the Bible. Then um, Revelation, which we just did. We had like 96 people sign up for that class. That was crazy. Uh, but we did verse by verse the entire book of Revelation. And I probably confuse people because I constantly would go back to the Old Testament to introduce the class, to show people how things were all working out that way. And so uh, that was, Revelation is one of my favorite books. I love it. We'll teach that again, definitely. Church history, there's a real reason. I mean, we, we, we go to school and we learn about American history, Western civilization, African history, Chinese history. But how much do you know about church history? That's, I mean, that's really... You know, our faith is built on the foundation of those who came up before us. We really should know church history and uh, how it developed. And then hermeneutics, uh, more precise, maybe advanced hermeneutics. How do you really go in deep and study the Bible? So that's what I'm working on. So those church history and hermeneutics are, are works in progress coming soon to a classroom near you. Are we doing, okay, we're doing good on time. Um, so the last thing to kind of point on the theology program is that we do theology in community, okay? There is this, it's really strange, and, and I would love to start a conversation, but I don't know if we have time with like Daniel over there who's from Peru. But in the United States, we're very much individualistic people, right? We don't focus on community nearly as much. We're very independent. That's built into the American spirit, as somebody once said. And so oftentimes, we approach God's word and we say, okay, what does it mean to me? That's all we're trying to do. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to me? What do I think about it? And we never go beyond ourselves in the text. And we're just like, you know, I'll just, I'll just figure it out. I'll know what it is. But, but that's not the way God designed the church. God designed the church to be community. And so we believe that truth is not found in spirit-illuminated individuals. You will not find truth in self. Remember, uh, Jeremiah said the heart is de deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If it's coming from you and you alone, be very careful about that. 
but in a community of spirit-illuminated individuals. And so in other words, we're saying, what does what the community of, of Christianity say? Therefore, we believe that the body of Christ, both alive and dead, we have just as much to learn from dead people as we do from people who are alive, must come together to understand theology, shaping it from many perspectives and differing experiences. This is doing theology in community. For instance, have you ever been reading the Bible and you're like, wow, what does that mean? That's, that's, that's pretty difficult to understand. Then have you ever thought, well, you know, I, I know what the apostles thought about it because I'm reading the words that they wrote down. That's the scriptures, right? Illuminated by God. Inspired by God, I mean. But then like, well, what did, what did their disciples take? So the, you open up the church fathers. What did the church fathers have to say about that subject? They're the ones who learned directly from John and Peter and Paul, right? And they wrote extensively about these things. What did they believe? Well, what did, what did they believe in you know, 1200 AD in the church? What did they believe in the 1500s when the Reformation was happening? What did they believe in the 1900s or 20th century? You know, we, we, we look at things like that, and it's important because we see how things develop over time. And sometimes in church history, someone makes a decision in one way or one direction that, all, that dramatically alters people's understanding of it for a very long time. And it may be good and it may be bad. And what our goal is to test the things that, uh, against Scripture and to see how other people understood it so we can come up to it the best informed way we can. But Scripture is ultimately our final guide for everything, as we'll talk many about. Many times we get our theology from one person. He's the pastor you grew up with. Yeah. And whether he's right or wrong, that's what it is. And it's hard to break out of that mindset of, that's not how I was raised. That's not what this one pastor that I respect the most says. It's like you know where we're going in session two. <laughs> That's good insight, Dave. Thank you. So um, that being said, I'm not going to spend time on this. That's in your book, and you can look at that later if you want. But this is the end of session uh, one. Any, any questions before we take our break? We're doing good on time. I, I would say, Grace, uh, you were wondering about how Peruvians mm -hmm. uh, do theology. I would say it's very similar to what you see here. Mm. Uh, sometimes uh, there isn't that desire. To, if you're struggling with the scripture, you, know, you don't go out and ask questions. Uh, it's always, you know, like if there is a Bible study on Wednesdays, you go there, you know, you hear the message, and that's it. Yeah. So, well, and America is exporting our American Christianity all over the globe yeah. for mostly bad. <laughs> it's not; it hasn't been good. Uh, I, I think there is, uh, we'll say, like a wave of new churches in Peru that are emerging that are focusing more on the community aspect. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, you may not realize. Do you know the state of Christianity in the United States is so terrible that other countries are sending missionaries to us now? Things are dire here. We, so you sometimes don't think about it that way, but it's bad. It's really, really bad. There is a lot of bad theology and a lot of really bad churches. And other countries, Christian communities, look at us and say, they don't know the gospel in America. We're going to go and send people there to preach the gospel to them. That's how bad things are here. That's, that's why like High Point Church is part of the Engage Network, and we plant churches. Because we realize if somebody doesn't start planting churches, and there's lots of other little networks throughout the country that are doing that, Christianity is done for here. I mean, we're going to be like Europe, where you have 0.01% of the population who's Christian. So, all right. So, what does it mean to do theology? You know, because I had the quotes up there. I figured I'd add those in. Um, anyone ever seen this book? This is a real book. Oh, nope. Anyone ever seen this book? It's a real book. So you could, you, uh, at one point in time, you could go into Barnes & Noble and find this in the religion section, right next to uh, the Bible for Dummies. So they had the Dummies version and the Idiots uh, guides back in the day. And that's the third edition, so it must have been pretty popular. <clears throat> oh, the Idiots books and the Dummies books were incredibly popular. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes um, when we hear people use big words, um, we can feel that way. This is really annoying, uh, by the way. So um, we can feel that way a little bit, right? 
You ever been, so maybe, maybe it wasn't a theology, but you know, sometimes when I get around people who know like basketball really well and they start talking, I get really confused what they're saying because I don't know some of the terms because I'm not a basketball guy. Ladies, can you relate? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, but can anyone relate to something like that? Where there's a sport or there's a topic, and someone just kind of just starts going on and on, and they're like throwing out terms, and you're like, I have no idea what you're saying. You lost me at high. <laughs> I'm just impressed at the amount of knowledge that some people have for sports. Yeah. It's just like crazy. Yeah, do you know who did this in 1967? Yeah. No. <laughs> or a certain play that they did, you know, back in. I have that problem when my brother, two brothers get to talk to me about uh, diesel trucks and mechanics. I'm a truck driver, but I don't know the mechanical part of the engines. It's like, I just nod my head. <laughs> <sighs> so maybe next time someone does that to me, I'll just look at, hey, can you explain to me the Granville Sharp rule in Greek? <laughs> You just got to, you know, flip the ties a little bit. Everybody knows a lot about something is my point, right? You all know a lot about something. Yvonne, what's your thing? What's your thing that you can talk about that you might lose other people on? Gardening. Oh. And soil. Yeah. <laughs> You've exhausted my understanding of it. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can gut anything and put it back together. Contractors See, there you go. See, everybody has their thing that they can go on and on about. And they've learned this, these terms, for whatever reason, over time, that you just take for granted. You know it. And then when you throw the term out there and someone else doesn't understand, you're like, well, why don't you get it? Right? Because it's your world. You know about those things. So as you look up here and you see some of these words, there's probably words you don't know. Maybe you've heard them before, right? But uh, in every class that I have, there's these words, okay? And we use these words because they mean something. So for those who, who, who like to do deep theology, they're, they're words that they take for granted. Um, so cessationism, relativism, rationalism, truth, modernism, prophecy, Protestant theology, continuationism. You probably even think you know the term, the definitions of some of these words, but you may not really. Because sometimes when we follow people in conversations, you ever be like, oh yeah, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, you just kind of follow along like you understand. And I sometimes feel like we do that uh, when it comes to the Bible and theology. And so we will touch on all these words in the, over the next nine weeks. You'll be more familiar with them, if nothing else, right? Back on track. What is theology? That's where we were. Um, so take a moment, write down a one or two sentence definition of theology. Just take a stab at it or just, you know, and then feel free to shout it out when you got one. There's no right or wrong answers at the moment. As you're thinking about that, it might be helpful to think, does an atheist have a theology? <laughs> Someone chuckled. <laughs> it is kind of funny to think about, but that does play into how you might define theology. See, we might, because we're churchgoers, Christians, you know, we might narrow our definition of theology in such a way that it only fits a very narrow amount of people. But maybe theology is broader than that. Well, for the atheists, it's interesting because although they don't acknowledge it, they actually seem to understand it. Yeah. They will deny it, right? Yep. Yeah, you can't deny something if you don't know something about it. Right. <laughs> Someone once pointed out, atheists spend a whole lot of time talking about God. They do. <laughs> so, would an atheist fall under representation of theologians? Uh, perhaps, yeah. I'm not sure they would like that terminology. Right. <laughs> Before I was a Christian, I was an atheist. Would have, I would have classified myself there and held to that belief. All right, so who wants to throw out their definition? What do you got? What would you come up with? One's belief system about God. Okay, one's belief system about God. I like it. It's, it's good. Anyone else add or, or detract from that? I just put down that it's your belief in God because your theology is your theology. Okay, and you can't dare question your theology, That's right? What That's I'm a very saying. postmodern view. Yeah, I like thank it. you. You're living in a postmodern world. But, but, it, but I had a very 
finite definition. Of you were narrowing it down, yep. yes. And, and that was broad. But a theology in general is the, is the study and of your belief in yeah. God or create. Well, I guess. Yeah. Well, here, let's see how some people, uh, maybe more learned than us, uh, would define it. Millard Erickson, he's a uh, professor of theology, wrote some systematic theology books. He defines it as the study or science of God. That's, that's how he defines it. Augustine, 4th, 5th century Christian, um, he said it's the rational discussion respecting the deity. Yeah, that's, that's a mouthful. Like, what does that even mean? Um, A.H. Strong said the science of God and of the relations between God and the universe. We would be part of the universe, so that would encompass that as well. Charles Ryrie, he said, thinking about God and expressing those thoughts in some way, right? So he's kind of saying, hey, it's, it's not just thinking deep thoughts, it's not just studying, but it's how you express it too. So he's, he's putting on what you do with it once you kind of figure that out. Um, Webster's Dictionary just defines it this way. The science of God or of religion, the science which treats the existence, character, and attributes of God, his laws and government. The doctrines we are to believe and the duties we are to practice, even divinity, a more commonly understood, the knowledge derivable from scriptures, the systematic exhibition of revealed truth, the science of Christian faith and life. You ever get the feeling that Webster's Dictionary was just trying to take as many definitions as possible and thrust them together? Um, so, um, but yeah, um, so... Theology, though, I think just understood is it really is just the study of God. That's literally what theology means. And so you can narrow that or you can broaden it. But, but maybe to figure out what theology is, we should ask, who is a theologian, right? Who is a theologian? We sometimes think of theologians as the people who are professors. Maybe a pastor is a theologian or something like that. But would anybody in here call themselves a theologian? Would you update your Facebook page and say professional theologian or something like that? Maybe not professional, but theologian. Theologian yeah, at large. Maybe after this class. Maybe after this class? <laughs> theologian in training. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what if I said everyone's a theologian? Is it basically just a person who asks questions, wants to know, and... But doesn't everybody, though, in some way? So think yeah. about the big questions of life. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why are we here? What's our purpose? Mm -hmm. We're asking questions like that. We are making some kind of inform, uh, informed or uninformed decision about who God is, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you do not factor God into that, your theology then is there is no God. But, it, but, but, it, but the idea of God is so prevalent in all of humanity that you either have to, at the very base, say yes or no, or I don't know, Right? And so as soon as you do that, you have actually made a theological decision about who God is, and you are, you are now a theologian. You may be a bad theologian, because you're, you're very uninformed at that point, but you are a theologian because you've made some kind of assumption or decision about God. So a theologian then is a person who um, inquires about God, then, yeah. basically? Or, or, re, or refutes God. Okay. Even. That's why I'd say even an atheist is a theologian, although they would not like that terminology. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. What is, I mean, Dan Kay should know this, but what is the base, the root word, like theo and theos? Or what is the, theos is God. Uh, ology okay. is study of. So it literally just means study of God. So, so you might, say, if you want to more narrow it down, you might just say, hey, it's somebody who's actually devoting themselves to the study of God. Well, then, how many of you have read your Bibles in the last week or month? Or, we'll even, we'll, we'll, in the last 10 years, just, just in case, you know, don't want to put anyone on the spot here. <laughs> You studied God, right? Essentially. So, Everyone has a theology, though, is kind of the idea. There's no one who doesn't, whether, uh, as we've talked about. Um, so, who is a theologian? Anyone who has asked the ultimate questions about life. Why am I here? What is life? What happens after death? What is the difference between right and wrong? Why is there something instead of nothing? Okay. Um, if, you, if you really have a, ever struggle with any of those questions, you're doing theology in some level. The question is not, who is a theologian? But what kind of a theologian am I going to be? 
Are you going to be a good theologian or a bad theologian? This is a more accurate question because as one writer put it, not all theologians are equal. Okay? It kind of be like, you know, a, uh, a sports cast individual, right? People I get very opinionated about good ones and bad ones for whatever reason. I don't watch enough sports really to understand the difference. But I know they get really upset about it because there's some who really know their stuff. There's some who are overly opinionated. There's some who don't know their stuff. There's some who are there only because of some other reason. And so people get confused. Well, it's the same thing. We're all theologians in different areas of life. We're either good theologians, bad theologians, growing theologians. <clears throat> uh, but we're somewhere on some kind of scale in our theology and how we do theology. R.C. Sproul put it this way. <clears throat> we live in what may be the most anti-intellectual period in the history of Western civilization. We must have passion, yes, indeed, hearts on fire for the things of God. But that passion must resist with intensity the anti-intellectual spirit of the world. As a pastor, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people say, in the face of clearly seeing what Scripture shows and teaches, not even a difficult passage, it's just plain as day, say, but yeah, I, I feel, though, that God wants me to do this. Right? We, we elevate emotion. We, we elevate feelings over anything else at times. And that's what R.C. Sproul is getting at here, anti-intellectualism. Okay? We can have great passion, but be completely wrong. And even against God, in a way. <clears throat> and so we want to be careful. So, can they still be a theologian, or? Like, can, so like, I'm trying to think, like, I became a Christian, and I'm saved, I started going to church, and learn, and then like, almost like I reach a peak in my development, and then I just become apathetic towards God, and the church, and, you know, I just become a churchgoer, and I stop doing theology. Yeah. Because of that. Well... There's different ways to answer that question. I'm going to propose it with just a thought or an idea. It could be the possibility that in that circumstance, one is living out their theology. And what I mean by that, they've kind of come to a point where they realize, I don't see the benefit right now for doing these things. And so that could produce apathy in a way. I, I'm not saying that is, right. but I'm saying that's one strong possibility. Sometimes it's so, too, it's sometimes we know what God wants us to do or what he's, the scriptures are telling us to do, but because we don't like it, we don't want to be confronted by it, and so we stop doing those things, too. So there's lots of reasons why. I don't know what it is for you, so I'm not trying to project on you. But, yeah. Um, but typically, one lives out their theology. I mean, if you truly believe something, if you've, if you've truly accepted it as true and you're, you're trusting in it, you'll more than likely live that out at that time. That's why, like in James chapter 1, right, where it talks about, uh, you know, trials coming in, and it shows what kind of a Christian you are. Well, trials oftentimes produce, do we really believe what we say we believe or not? Um, so, something to think about. So we're going to classify people in the six different types of uh, the theologians, Okay. Tabloid theology, folk theology, lay theology, ministerial theology, professional theology, and academic theology. And then we're going to kind of put them on a scale and kind of show where, where I believe Christians probably should fall in on this type thing. Okay? Now, I will tell you that what we're about to talk about sometimes is some of the most profound <coughs> Things that people take away from this particular uh, first, you know, ten classes, introduction to the theology. Um, if I had Ray here with me, he would say that this this totally changed his mind about a lot of things when he kind of thought about which one he was. So, so let's let's dig in. The first one is a tabloid theologian. A tabloid theologian is one who constructs his or her theology 
based upon, and oftentimes naive, in other words, it's untested, uh, unverified information, hearsay, that has no basis in fact, and very little, if any, evidence to be believed. Many times people are tabloid theologians because of the theology's appearance of originality. As well, it can be cutting edge in many people's minds. So, ooh, it's the new shiny sometimes. Ooh, I like that. Um, <clears throat> or, ooh, it just sounds too good to be true. Um, they like the sensational aspect of it. So, so let's look at some ex examples of some tabloid theology. So they can be stories like the hitchhiking angel. So back in the 90s, there was this story that was going around about somebody who was driving uh, out in kind of an area that was kind of remote, and um, they pick up somebody who's a hitchhiker against their better judgment, and they give this person a ride, and they drive down like 100 miles, and then uh, the guy says, hey, let me out here, okay? And so pulls over, and he's like, but there's nothing here. Why do you want to be let out here? He's like, oh, this is, this is my stop. This is good. So he lets him out, and the guy gets out, and the car drives off, and then he stops and looks behind because he's really concerned about the person because there's really nothing around there, and he sees the person, you know, explode in light and fly off. Say, like, oh, I saw an angel. I was, I was, I was taking an angel down the road. Uh, or you get stories like the growing fire hose. That's another one that's, that was pretty popular uh, not too long ago where there was a house that was on fire and the uh, fire truck pulled up and they, the fire hydrant was too far away. They didn't have enough hose. And suddenly as they hook it up, the hose just starts growing. And they, they miraculously just have enough room to, to get far enough so they put the fire out. Or here's the one you're probably more familiar with. <clears throat> I, I, I died on the operating table. I left my body. I saw my body. I saw everything going around. And I went to heaven and I saw Jesus. And I saw my, my aunt and I saw my dog and I, you know, whatever the case is. And then Jesus said, it's not your time, and I went back into my body, type thing. Okay. Ever read a book or seen a movie about that? Isn't that 90 seconds in heaven or 90 minutes in heaven or whatever that movie was? Uh, there, there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's <laughs> one of them, yeah. Yeah, and, but there's a lot of them too, but down the road they feel so guilty about it after they've already made all their money uh, on those books and movie deals saying, no, it never really happened, I made it up, I was pressured by my parents to make it, because oftentimes it's little kids that go through this, okay? So, um, or the proverbial, well, God told me to do this, okay? How many of you remember Mark Driscoll? A few of you. There's a podcast where they're exploring what happened at Mars Hill. It's called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. It's just, it's just saying how, how did Mark Driscoll come into power and how did it fall and crumble almost overnight? And one of the things they say, his myth, his origin story, where he'd never really been in church, was not under the authority of any church, one day, went out to this river, saw a vision of God, and God, he came back and said, God told me to plant churches, uh, teach men, and marry Grace, which was this girl that he was sleeping with at the time. Okay? And so, uh, and then he went and started Mars Hill Church type thing. And so people talk about, hey, that's, that God told me. So he planted a church on God told me, you know, type thing. Would people, that, wouldn't that be also Mormonism? Yeah. Because, well, no, no, he found gold tablets. Well, yeah, but the angel told him how to. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I'm saying. It's, it's that, that yeah. same type of theology there. But don't you love it? Hey, you know what God told me? You know what I found out from God? I got this hidden information. It's un totally unverifiable and you can never trust it or, or, or figure it out. You just have to believe me. God told me. Yeah, we got. It. I don't know you, but I sense that when you bring this out, you're not mocking or discounting mm -mm. because. But we have to be discerning and testing uh, because it's very likely that some of these things did happen. We don't know. You don't know. But, but, so I don't see you as mocking. No, the whole point is you build your entire theology, though, on these things. Yeah. Not, not ever even testing it with Scripture or anything. Same thing. Um, yeah, I'm just bringing up all the stories that, that pulled up. Yep. Mm -hmm. There are some things that are totally unexplainable. So somebody who's, who's totally focused on that, and they're a tabloid theologian, and, and that's what they, their theology is based on from story to story like that. Um, Ephesians 4.14 comes to mind. 
As a result, we are no longer to be children. So this is, this is the reason why there's pastors and teachers and you're supposed to be part of a church because they're supposed to build us and get us away from this. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Okay? So for every story that may be true out of any of that stuff, there's more of them that are proven untrue at some point in time where somebody says, hey, it didn't actually happen, or things fall apart so much, like in the story of Mars Hill uh, and Mark Driscoll. You know, that, that, that exploded incredibly uh, um, overnight and built this huge church and then just completely crumbled, you know, for various things. And so you start to wonder, was that ever actually true? And then as they're doing that, like that rise, rise and fall of Mars Hill, they start to realize the story changed and morphed over time as they interviewed people and put it all together. And so we need to, we need to be not so open to everything that we just take in everything that sounds like it could be something spiritual. But, but many times we just don't know any better. And so we just assume everything is true. It's tabloid theology. Here's another one for you. Folk theology. <clears throat> That's what Dave was talking about earlier. One who uncritically and unreflectively constructs his or her, her theology according to traditions and religious folklore. The folk theologian is often very dogmatic and militant about his or her beliefs. So the idea here is that the, there are things like, well, why do we do this? Well, that's the way we always did it, right? Um, there's, there's traditions. We don't really sure, know, sure when it started, where it came from. We can barely even trace it back to scripture. And if we can, sometimes it's even kind of loosely there. And you're like, it's out of context, but that's how we do things. And that's what we believe or, or religious folklore type thing. Um, and so um, one, one is very, here, here's one for you from those who took angelology. There, sometimes there is this prevailing idea that before the Garden of Eden, there was a war in heaven between God and Satan. And Satan lost, and God kicked them out of heaven, okay? The problem with that is, it doesn't exist in the Bible. But most Christians believe that. Do you know where it came from? Oh, my angelology people don't remember? It came from a story written by a guy called Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. And if you read it, it is actually vulgar and disgusting. Um, what happens in that? But that is the prevailing dominant view across Roman Catholics and Protestants in Western civilization on, on their origin story. I'm not saying Satan never fell. I'm just saying that does not exist in the Bible, uh, that specific story. And so that's an idea of, of folk theology. But here's, here's some more. Views of heavens. You know, sometimes people think that you go to heaven and it's clouds and harps. And, right? you, get your, and you get wings. And you, and you get wings. Mm -hmm. You get white robes. You know, well, we do get white robes in a certain standpoint. Uh, yes, that part might be true. And, and folk theology doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. It just means it's unverified. You've never tested it or trusted it to see if it's true or accurate. There's good folk theology and there's bad folk theology. The problem is you just don't know because nothing's being tested. Uh, ghosts. What are ghosts? Where do they come from? And if we ask that question, we get a lot of different views. Angels' wings. Every time a bell rings, an angel. angel gets its wings. You know how many Christians I hear talk about, you know, when babies die, they become angels, or when people die, they become angels? Is that taught in Scripture? It's a nice thought, I guess, if you want to be an angel. Uh, but the Bible says that for now, we're a little bit lower than the angels, but we'll eventually be exalted above the angels and rule over angels. That's what Scripture teaches. We won't be angels. And the only angels that have wings, and angel is the word loosely, you'll never see angel and wing in the same area. The only supernatural being in the Bible that has wings are seraphim and cherubim, and the Bible never calls them angels. Um, good works, salvation. Our works save us. All people are good at heart. Crosses ward off evil. You ever, when you ask that question, you ever anyone say that? You're uh, earlier you're talking about the cross. No, but there was another one I was going to share real quick too because I had a whole list of these responses. <laughs> but the one that just really irritated me the most, sorry, was um, when I asked why you you know, wear the cross. And she said, oh, it's just nice jewelry. Ah, uh, yeah. I've and so I had to walk away from that one. 
What about Peter's gate? When you die, don't you go to Peter's gate? And Peter lets you in or not? Is that in scripture? What about the devil has a pitchfork, obviously, right? And a pointy tail and horns. Mm -hmm. And he's red. And he's red. Yeah, yeah obviously. <laughs> Where does that come from? Oh, boy. God helps those who help themselves. Ever heard of that terminology before? Is that in the Bible? Evidences of demon possession. Sometimes people make evidence of demon possession. It's like, well, that doesn't really line up the way scripture shows demon possession. And, you know, so we sometimes, you know, does that, does that verify with what scripture teaches? People who commit suicide automatically go to hell. That's a popular one you hear a lot. When you die, there will be a screen in heaven which shows to the world all the bad things you have done. Yeah, there obviously cannot be a screen in heaven because screens were not exist until the 20th century and God is older than that. So what about the people before that? What did they get to view it on? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> a tablet. A tablet. <laughs> There's a reason why the Apple symbol has a bite taken out of it. Apple's existed since then. So in, in heaven, they have had iPhones for a very long time. Name it, claim it, health and wealth gospel type things. Okay. So, I mean, and, and there, there can be good things that folk theology is, you know, sometimes, you know, can, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. You need to, uh, you know, sometimes you need to walk forward to get saved on a Sunday morning at an invitational type thing. You know, that, sometimes there's not necessarily anything bad with things, but are they actually in scripture? Have we tested? Have we verified things? Um, so there's that one. Then we have, uh, oh, let's talk about this for a moment. Um, oftentimes those who are totally focused on folk theology, they've learned through tradition, they've learned just kind of whatever church they've grown up in, um, it can be hard for those individuals sometimes to learn to do good theology. Why do you think that is? Well, part of it, is it questions your core belief, because that's how I was raised, that's what I believe, and if you question that, it questions my core belief of Am I saved or everything about God? Okay, yeah. Okay. Because they're deep-rooted, held convictions we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? So, <clears throat> someone once told me a long time ago, and this isn't necessarily biblical, it's just, you know, when you're, when you're having a discussion of someone, or to use the word argument, this, as soon as one person loses their temperament and takes it to an emotional level, that person's already lost the argument. Because oftentimes you go there because you really don't have anything to stand on, right? Um, the, the, the most annoying person in the world is a person who knows exactly what they believe and why they believe it. Because you, you can't shake them um, because they're saying, hey, no, th I know this to be true. This is a verifiable fact. But sometimes when you just take things as, oh, I believe that, but I really don't know why, you will fight tooth and nail to hold on to that no matter what, right? So it, it can be difficult. Um, a folk theologian, I kind of think of this verse, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their, good sense, or have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Uh, someone who is steeped in folk theology, there's zero discernment going on. They've taken things in, it's built their worldview, and they're not budging and moving, even if scripture clearly shows something different or something along those lines. All right, we've got to make up some time here. Lay theologian, a lay person who takes responsibility for his or her theological understanding, unlike the folk and tabloid theologian is. So someone who's doing lay theology, they're more reflective on theological ideas. They'll seek to distinguish between essential and non-essential doctrines. Sometimes people who are folk in theology, everything's essential or everything's not essential. It's one or the other. But there's essential and there's non-essential things. Uh, more critical of unfounded traditions in folk theology. They'll start to question some of those things and ask good questions. They're willing to use some study tools. You know, they'll open up their study Bible. They'll get a commentary, something along those lines to kind of help them dig deeper. They're still growing in spiritual maturity and or their understanding of the essentials, but, but they're growing. They're moving in the right direction. They're asking questions. 
What does a lay theologian look like? Well, it's someone who asks questions instead of accepting everything that may sound spiritual. They use tools like study Bibles and commentaries or even a Strong's Concordance. They'll read to understand the context of the Bible passage, not just find a text to support a preconceived idea. <clears throat> Oftentimes, those who are still steeped in folk theology will go and they'll say, I got to find a verse to support this, regardless of the context of the passage. I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> I know the Bible well enough that I can, I, can, I can proof text anything you want me to. You just name it, I'll proof text it for you. You, you can, that is not rightly handling the word of God, though. Okay? There, are, there, are, there is a context to every script verse in the Bible, and every passage, and every book. You have to understand that, to rightly understand how the word of God is laid out. And so, um, someone who is moving to a lay theologian aspect, they're, they're starting to understand that and move in that direction. Acts 17, 11. Now these are the more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word of great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. They're doing what the Bereans did in Acts. They're starting to examine things and see, hey, I'm not just going to take Paul's word for, for what it is. We're going to say, is it really true? The ministerial theologian. <clears throat> A person who takes responsibility for building his or her theology, and who, unlike the lay theologian, is... This person is usually educated somehow, formally or informally, in how to do theology. They're able to use study tools and resources effectively. They're able to and willing to compare their personal theology against other beliefs. They're not intimidated by the Roman Catholic or the Lutheran or the, or the Baptist or, or whatever contrary view somebody might have. They're intent on devoting more time to reflection and study to ensure all their beliefs make sense together. And they're able to instruct others in theological ideas. Not only are they figuring out things for their own, but now they're able to kind of pour into other people more effectively. Some examples. There's pastors, teachers, whether it be Sunday school teachers, I mean, uh, whatever. I mean, the teachers of broad word. They're able to maybe craft a sermon or a devotional, you know, for some type of thing. Uh, craft a Sunday school lesson. They can lead a Bible study without having to have a book to kind of lead them through the whole thing. Oftentimes, most Bible studies and most book studies are just, they're not teachers, they're facilitators. They're not teachers. Um, disciple believers to maturity. Okay. I mean, that's a key thing. You cannot disciple someone to maturity if you yourself are not mature. Okay. I've heard times, sometimes I hear people say, well, Christians never get to maturity. Well, bogus. The Bible talks about Christians getting mature. That's what we're, you're supposed to move to that area. That's the whole ministry of Paul and Timothy and Titus. <coughs> Excuse me, my mouth's getting dry. So, I mean, so maturity is a level that Christians can hit. I'm not saying perfection, sinless perfection. I'm not saying that. But maturity, where you, you're able to understand the Bible and to teach other people about it. That's what maturity is about. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul told Timothy, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I'm going to tell you, you would not be saved today if it wasn't for individuals who had done this in the past. Our faith is dependent upon faithful individuals passing the faith down from generation to generation. <clears throat> Defining theology. A professional theologian, one who constructs his or her theology and makes a living doing so. So this is the difference here now is somebody who's making a living doing this. They're more oriented toward teaching lay and ministerial theologians. They conduct practical and original research. They have mastered and build study tools. They critically evaluate theological trends and folk theology with the purpose of helping others come to informed decisions. These are the people that are engaged in apologetics like Ken Ham or uh, would be a good example of that. The guy does a creation museum out in Kentucky in the ark. These would be Bible translators. These are the people who are taking the Greek and the Hebrew and translating. So you get your ESV, your LSB, your NASB, your KJV, or whatever the case is. Study Bibles and commentary sets. They're writing these things. They're, they're writing Greek and Hebrew materials that teach people the original languages. They're Bible study authors. 
they're 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 buying the books that these facilitators are 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 using uh, in their classes. They're Bible college and seminary professional professors. I'm going to tell you probably as I look around this room, that's probably not going to be anybody here, right? <clears throat> this is the first one that's probably without you know without extreme measures anybody in this room will ever attain to at the professional but not necessarily i mean i can think of somebody like a uh ladies you know jen wilkins is right you know she probably never thought she'd be writing bible studies so it's possible i'm just saying it's you know uh, the goal though <clears throat> oh and the author books on various theological subjects <clears throat> Professional theologians are often accused of quenching the spirit. Why do you think that might be? And we'll end on this question, and then we'll wrap up the rest of the session next week. But why do you think professional theologians are sometimes accused of quenching the spirit? <coughs> well, sometimes they make it so academic that it... They stop your wanting to learn. They In other words, understand. yeah, because like mm -hmm. you say, they talk over your head because they use the big words, and it's like I can't learn, so I'm not even going to try. Okay. Any other thoughts? I think there might be the difference between mind and emotion, and then the emphasis about it may not be the kind they can express emotions, and so quenching the, the whole topic of the Holy Spirit is a kind of an unreachable thing. Sure. I'm thinking like because they um, prepare material or, or study and, and maybe compare their study against folk theology, they're kind of like suppressing that freedom where like, you know, other people would say like, yeah, the Holy Spirit is telling me those things or I believe this without any proof of anything. So that's like this huge freedom that these professional theologians have more rights than. Well, this is what the Bible says, this is the evidence. We live in this environment. That's what the Bible teaches. So, <clears throat> I think Daniel might be on to something. Typically, people at this level are the people who are writing books against current theological trends, and people are intimidated by people who are educated who, and who can be critical of opposing views and ideas. Right? Um, and so, now... The Davids, as we'll call you two, who I'll give the other answers. You're not wrong, but I would not put that a professional theologian. There is actually another one, the academic theologian, oh, okay. who is the ivory tower theologian, sometimes we call it. They're the individuals who never come down to a level that anybody else can relate to. And so there, there is a, there's a case for both. Most of the guys I know, and I have lots of friends who would be professional theologians, <coughs> are very down to earth. Because their goal is to teach other pastors, to teach pastors, or to teach uh, other professors and stuff. And so they're, they're, they have to use some big words, yes, but they, they can define them and explain them in simple terms because they're teaching people what those things are. It's when you go beyond that to a whole other level where you're so academic that you cannot actually relate or talk to people who are not at your level, that's the problem. Uh, and that's the difference between the two. So... And we'll talk more about the academic theologian next week. I'll close this in a word of prayer. And let's uh, get to uh, 10 o'clock service. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we had. Um, thank you for helping us overcome those technical issues this morning. I pray that these would be good things for us to think about as we wrestle with these things in our minds, what type of a theologian we are, whether we want to do good theology, bad theology. Uh, I pray for everybody here that, uh, if nothing else, we'll at least have a better understanding of where we're at as an individual. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.